African rhythms Passed down to us through ancient spirits Feel the spirit A unifying force Come on, move with the spirit Stand up, clap your hands Move with the rhythms, get down from WSNC 90.5 FM, a broadcasting service and NPR affiliate of Winston-Salem State University. Welcome to Africa World Now Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. Today, a replay of the recent historic press conference with the Cuban permanent representative to the UN, His Excellency Ambassador Pedro Luis Pedroso Cuista. Africa World Now Project is next. June 23, 2021, a total of 184 countries voted in favor of a resolution to demand the end of the U.S. blockade on Cuba for the 29th year in a row, with the United States and Israel being the only countries voting against the resolution. Three countries, Colombia, Ukraine, and Brazil, abstained. Wednesday, July 7th of last week, the world received news of the assassination of the then Haitian president in the midst of already tense conditions on the ground. On this same day, a historic press conference with the Cuban permanent representative to the UN, His Excellency Ambassador Pedro Luis Pedroso Cuista, presented a review and response of the recent vote against the blockade, as well as the challenges and promises of the recent development of the Cuban COVID-19 vaccines. On Saturday, July 10th, reports via mainstream media outlets began proliferating images and a narrative that suggested the Cuban people were protesting against the ineffectiveness of the government. However, more detailed and clear journalism shows that this was not the case, as the mass majority of the protesters were clear in their disdain for the embargo, which in turn has caused deleterious impact on the population. According to the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the economic sanctions on Cuba were imposed by the United States of America in 1960 and were subsequently amended by the Cuban Democracy Act of 1992 and the Helms-Burton Act of 1996. These acts essentially banned all commercial ties between the United States and Cuba and severely impaired the right of U.S. citizens to travel, to communicate with, or carry out cultural exchanges with Cuba. Every year since 1992, the General Assembly has passed a resolution calling for an end to the embargo. The most recent resolution on this issue, A-67-4, was adopted on November 13, 2012, by 88 votes against three, with two abstentions. Since the United States is the major regional economic power and the main source of new medicines and technologies, Cuba is subject to deprivations that impinge on its citizens' human rights. Moreover, the U.S. makes its own foreign trade policy extraterritorial through a system of secondary sanctions which force third-party countries into imposing an embargo on Cuba. For your benefit, and in accordance with the central mission of Africa Vote Now Project, which is to provide a platform that allows you to intentionally organize information toward understanding the root causes of issues that impact historically and ethnically marginalized peoples, paying specific attention to the Africana world, Today, we will play the recording of the historical press conference, organized in part by yours truly having nominal input under the leadership of Obi Ekbuna Jr. and a collection of other concerned communities and organizations. Next, you will hear the Cuban permanent representative to the UN, His Excellency Ambassador Pedro Luis Pedroso Cuista, present a review and response of the recent vote against the blockade, as well as the challenges and promises of the recent development of the Cuban COVID vaccines. Our show is produced today in solidarity with the native, indigenous, African, and Afro-descended communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Cooperation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, Ghana, Haiti, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all people. Enjoy the program. Some burn murder never grand truth is death set, spirits of the land restless. 
Good morning, all. My name is Gail Walker, and I want to welcome all members of the uh, media as well as members of the community to this press conference to address the recent vote at the UN, uh, the United Nations General Assembly, in opposition to the US government's embargo of Cuba and Cuba's successful COVID 19 vaccine campaign. Uh, I will open up the conference with a brief statement. We will then hear from Reverend Dr. Joan Brown Campbell, the former General Secretary of the National Council of Churches. Reverend Campbell will introduce Ambassador Pedro Perdosa uh, Cuesta, Cuba's permanent representative to the United Nations. The ambassador will then take questions. Given the time constraints, questions have already been received. However, further questions can be submitted in the chat for consideration. The question and answer session will be facilitated by Mr. Bill Martinez of Martinez Arts Consulting and Ms. Marguerite Horberg, uh, founder and executive director of Hot House. And finally, there will be a closing remarks by Mr. Obi uh, Egbuna of the Get Out of Cuba's Way campaign and the Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association. So let us begin. Again, my name is Gail Walker and I am the executive director of IFCO, the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organization and co-chair of the National Network on Cuba. In both capacities, I have worked to support improved relations between the US and Cuba and for an end to the harmful uh, blockade, the harmful sanctions imposed against the Cuban people. Furthermore, as a faith-based organization committed to social justice, IFCO applauds the results of the recent uh, June 23rd UN vote, where the overwhelming majority of the world's nations voted in favor of a resolution to demand the end to the US economic blockade on Cuba, as it has for the past 28 consecutive years. We're deeply saddened that the Biden administration failed to join the rest of the world in voting yes. Yet it is another indication of the US government's isolation and its policy of blockading Cuba. The US government's longstanding sanctions have had a tremendous effect upon Cuba and its people. And this is the case in many sectors, but particularly devastating in the medical area. I was in Cuba a few weeks ago and witnessed firsthand the current medical crisis. Our multiple bags stuffed with medical supplies barely made a dent in terms of the need. It was heartbreaking to speak to a surgeon who had to tell his patients he couldn't perform surgery due to the lack of antibiotics and painkillers. However, it is important to note that Cuba has the ability, the technical know-how to produce the medicines the country requires, but is unable to do so due to the lack of raw materials needed to manufacture many of the basic medicines it needs, including antibiotics and pain relievers. Under US law, any company that uses 10% of US derived materials is not permitted to trade with Cuba. This holds true whether the company is a US company or not. And it's, it's just one example of the extraterritorial nature of the US policy toward Cuba and why it's called a blockade instead of a unilateral embargo. Nonetheless, still, Cuba has managed to produce five vaccine candidates to fight COVID-19 Cuba reports that one of the vaccines, Abdallah, has a 92.28% efficacy rate, rate, placing it in the top five of currently recognized vaccines worldwide. Ironically, while Cuba has managed to produce effective treatments for COVID, the small island nation has a shortage of syringes to help get shots in the arms of the Cuban population. And that's why the syringes for Cuba campaign organized by the global health partners here in the US and supported by the National Network on Cuba's Saving Lives campaign has raised $400,000 to purchase 4 million syringes and is currently working to raise another $100,000 to purchase an additional 2 million syringes. And these are in addition to the syringes sent from others in the international community. If relieved of the crippling US sanctions, Cuba would be able to address its medical needs. In fact, over the past year alone, Cuba has sent 3,700 medical workers, healthcare workers, in 52 international medical brigades to 39 countries overwhelmed by the pandemic. Cuba's international medical brigades have treated patients and saved lives 
for the past 15 years in 53 countries confronting natural disasters and serious epidemics such as the Ebola crisis in West Africa. Cuba has pledged to produce 100 million doses of its COVID-19 vaccine to meet its commitment to share its low cost vaccines with poorer nations in the developing world. Another example of Cuba's medical internationalism uh, is the medical school scholarships that the Caribbean island offers young people from various nations, including the United States. My organization, IFCO, is proud to facilitate this opportunity for U.S. students. Today, there are nearly 200 U.S. graduates of Cuba's Latin American School of Medicine, with nearly 60% practicing in underserved communities across the country. As Cuba struggles to confront its current medical crisis, her friends in the international community, and particularly those of us in the U.S., the very country that has maintained the punishing sanctions for more than six decades, educators, social workers, labor activists, clergy, and more, those of us who make up the vast Cuba Solidarity Network will continue to stand up and speak out against the unjust blockade and continue to work for normal relations. We'll continue to do this work uh, for our uh, to normal relations uh, with our Southern neighbor. So thank you, I thank you very much. Now we will hear from Reverend Dr. Joan Brown Campbell the former General Secretary of the National Council of Churches of Christ in the USA. In addition to being the first ordained woman to lead the NCC, Reverend Campbell has served as a de devoted activist for peace and social justice. She has played a critical role uh, in the fight for the return of Elian Gonzalez to Cuba in the year 2000, as well as the return of the Cuban Five. Reverend Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. Joan Brown Campbell, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I was listening very carefully to what you said and uh, am so pleased to think that we are still fighting and we are still working as hard as we can to bring to, to reality the relationship between Cuba and the United States. One of the things that I know from my time in Cuba is that Cuba has many gifts to give us. And it is our problem when we don't go away and don't take, back, take time to understand what the gifts they have, their abilities to deal with people who are not well. Um, I know that myself, I became very, quite very sick at one time when I was there and it was nothing until a few minutes until I was taken care of and became quite well again. I'll never forget that. But it's not one person, it's what happens in the United States. And I'm very concerned now that we are not bringing to the forth, and I'm thrilled that we're here today, that we can be saying once again, Cuba is here and we are here to be with them and to walk with this and to walk with people there so that we can become reconnected in a strength that is failing at some times because of what the United States is unwilling to let people come here to Cuba in the way that they did. I'm very glad for what we're here doing here today. And hopefully that when we live, when we leave, when we live, yes, you can tell that I'm getting older. Um, but it's what I really think is we need to be together in ways like this, and we need to be working with Cuba uh, because this is something that we have been doing for years. And I think there is much yet to be done and things for us to, uh, to give our lives to. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, Campbell. And I believe uh, is now your opportunity to introduce our um, special guest, uh, Ambassador uh, Pedroso uh, Cuesta. Yes, indeed. Uh, I, it is my honor to, uh, to introduce one that is known to many of you um, that will come to speak to us uh, in just a few minutes, standing here as a representative of Cuba to the... Uh, Yes, yes, here we come, all, all so that we can be together and we will be able to meet with him in just a moment. His Excellency. 
His Excellency, we are looking forward to seeing you and to hearing you speak. Ambassador Pedro. Ambassador. Pedro, question. Yes. Ambassador, we welcome you, Ambassador Pedro. Thank you very much, Joanne. I, I really appreciate it and, and good morning to all. Um, thank you, Gail, also for your, your introductory statement. Uh, first of all, allow me to thank you deeply, uh, National Network in Cuba and IFCO Pastor for Peace for organizing uh, this event. Also, thank you very much to all the members of the media uh, for the interest and all other participants um, in this exchange. Um, as you all know, and has been uh, stressed last June 23rd, by the 29 occasions, the United Nations General Assembly voted in over overwhelmingly in favor of the resolution necessity of ending the economic, commercial and financial blockade imposed by the government of the United States of America against Cuba. Only two countries, the United States and Israel, choose to vote against this resolution. In six decades, a lot has been told about this cruel, criminal, and genocidal policy. The voices against the blockade are every day more and more, even inside the US. You are a testi testimony uh, to that. I would like to thank you all for gathering uh, this morning here with me for this exchange as a representative of a courageous uh, people that fight, continue to fight and stand in front of two virus, and I would say two killer virus, the COVID-19 and the blockade imposed by the US. In the last four years, the government of the United States added 243 economic coercive measures against Cuba, which remains in effect today. These measures are not mere actions to tighten the embargo, but new methods, some of them unprecedented, that have escalated the economic war against Cuba to extreme levels, with widespread impact in the daily life of our people and in the Cuban economy. Those 243 unilateral coercive measures were intended to restrict travel by US citizens to our country and damage tourist markets in third countries. The Trump administration adopted those measures, which are proper, some of them to times of war, like, like the one adopted with the purpose of depriving Cuba from fuel supplies. They persecuted the health services that Cuba provide in numerous countries abroad. It increasingly harassed our country's commercial and financial transactions in other markets and set out to spread fear among foreign investors and commercial entities through the implementation of Title III of the Hans Burton Act. It also hindered the regular and institutional flow of remittances to families. They deal a harsh blow to self-employed and private workers and hamper the links with Cubans residing in the United States as well as family unification. All these measures remain in force today and are being fully implemented. Paradoxically, they are shaping up the behavior of the current US administration of President Biden, particularly through the, through the months when Cuba has experienced the highest COVID-19 infection rate the highest number of fatalities and much worse economic impact. Just in the past weeks, the US Department of State included Cuba in the unilateral list of trafficking in persons and, in, and of countries which are allegedly not cooperating fully with the US efforts in fighting terrorism. All those unilateral and arbitrary listing without any base, authority, or international support are only intended to defame and pressure countries refusing to bend to the will of the US 
and governments that stand on their own sovereign decisions. Cuba is not a state that sponsors international terrorism. All the country has been a country that has suffered from terrorism promoted, organized, and financed for the, from the US territory. No one can claim that Cuba is a state sponsor of terrorism. Cuba has an impeccable history, an impeccable fight of fighting international terrorism. Cuba disdainfully deplored every maneuver aimed at manipulating such a sensitive issue to achieve gross politically opportunistic goals. Going back to the embargo, for Cuba, the restrictions adopted during the last four years magnify the many challenges imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic and multiply its devastating socioeconomic, health-related, and financial impacts. Between April and December 2020, less than a year, just amid the pandemic, the blockade made Cuba to incur in losses estimated in the order of $3,586 billion. Added to the losses of the previous year, the total from April 2019 to December 2020 amounts to more than $9,157 billion. The accumulated damage of the blockade imposed to Cuba during six decades of economic embargo amounts to over 147,853 billion dollars. It is important to understand that if Cuba would not have to suffer that policy, and if Cuba would not have been deprived of those resources, the country could go a long way towards bringing much of its infrastructure up to date and could, for example, change the national energy matrix to renewable, to renewable sources in less than five years. That amount, if it was available, could considerable assist in enhancing the living standard of our people and would turn the country's financial situation around, boosting the confidence of foreign investors and creditors, and subsequently increasing the access of the country to financial markets. Under the present conditions, the embargo represents a huge burden for the Cuban population and economy, with particularly devastating effects owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. Cuba has been forced to allocate considerable resources to urgently secure necessary equipment and material for its national health system. The impact on the embargo of the embargo on the health sector, one of the hardest hit during the reporting period, may be seen in the shortages of essential consumer products, as well as the difficulties national industries face in acquiring the necessary supply for inter alia food preservation and drug manufacturing. The negative impact of the territorial component of the blockade could also be seen in the Cuban health sector. For instance, the cases of German, the German companies Sartorius and Merck stands out, as well as those of Sativa and other regular suppliers of laboratory materials reagents and general supplies. Due to the intensification of the blockade, they stopped trading with Cuba in 2020. During this period, Cuba was unable to obtain a total of 32 pieces of equipment and supplies related to the production of vaccine candidates against COVID-19 or needed to carry on 
ne the necessary stages for the completion of the clinical trials of these candidates, including equipment for the purification of the components, accessory for the production equipment, filtration tanks and capsules, potassium chloride solution, thimerosal, and reagents. As a result, Cuba had to resort to other providers and intermediaries, which led to, to price increases of 50 to 65% above normal established prices. Despite all these enormous obstacles and limitations, the work done by Cuba to tackle the pandemic has been recognized internationally. The country has five vaccine candidates I have been mentioned in development and has sent 57 medical brigades to support the fight against the pandemic in 40 countries and territories. The immoral smear campaign led by the government of the United States against Cuba International Health Cooperation has not been able to curb the intimidation of our professional staff. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Cuesta. This was a, a complete summary for all of us. Uh, I, you may have covered a lot of the topics that we're going to be talking about in this um, question and answer period. And I know that your time is limited, so we're gonna cut straight to the questions. Marguerite and I are going to ask um, most of the questions that were submitted to us, but in some cases we will paraphrase uh, the questions or combine them since some of the questions overlap from the different sources. We'll start out with the messages from Charlene Mohammed, uh, the host of Liberated Sisters on KPFK Radio, and Nisa Islam Mohammed, who is the editor for the Final Call Press Corps. Their first question is, uh, in his first uh, a major address, I should say, the Honorable Minister Luis Farrakhan uh, talked about the end of the bloqueo, the, the blockade against the country, so we can access uh, treatments. Can you tell us, your thoughts about that and how uh, Americans might be able to get uh, access to the vaccine. Thank you very much, Bill, and, and, and thank you very much to Charlene for the question. I, I, I think that the, um, the statement is um, uh, quite relevant. Uh, as I said before, uh, a, a lot of have been said about the embargo and the, the, the blockade policy um, has been um, gaining um, 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 the fight against the blockade has been gaining more, even more supporters, even included here in the in the US and particularly also in, in internationally. We we are seeing, uh, for example, the the caravans that um, have been uh, put in place um, the um, the last um, Sunday of every month. Um, all of them have been growing each time. Uh, bringing um, more people interested uh, against this fight and, and in solidarity with the, with the Cuban uh, people. So um, um, we, we, we are of the view that, that all these um, call, all these um, fight, all these um, actions against the blockade, the, the um, sending um, the resolutions that um, many of you are sponsoring in the different states and uh, actions um, to the presidency of the United States, to the White House, um, um, uh, letters to congressmen, uh, all, all that is extremely uh, useful and, and, and valuable. And, and, and in, in, in relation to the question of how, how people here in the US can have access to the vaccine um, um, once they are in place, um, you know, Cuba has always been uh, open to provide and share um, whatever um, achievement uh, the country has been able to make with um, with all the countries around the, the world. And of course, uh, the U.S. is, is not less. I, I, I would like to remember at this point. You are currently listening to a recording of a historic press conference held July 7, 2021, where the Cuban Permanent Representative to the UN, His Excellency Ambassador Pedro Luis Pedroso Cuista, 
is presenting a review and response of the recent vote against the blockade, as well as the challenges and promises of the recent development of the Cuban COVID vaccines. Our show was produced today in solidarity with the Native, Indigenous, African, and Afro-descended communities of Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, Ghana, Haiti, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all people. Continue to enjoy the program. Remember, on this specific um, occasion, the the the, um, um, the offer made uh, by Cuba to the U.S. when when Katrina um, affected this country, actually, the uh, the Henry Reef contingent was um, specifically um, formed to 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 um, to help and assist in the fight against the um, uh, the consequences of Katrina that you all know was not accepted by the by the government of, of the time um, so um, cuba will be open to share uh, with all countries including uh, with the u.s um, um, its outcome in in terms of the development of these uh, vaccine candidates as in other um, 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 areas of scientific research and, and so are you seeing uh, uh, the level of movement to end the blockade uh, um it is sort of a, a, an open-ended question, but are you are we optimistic that we're somehow we're in si se puede that we shall succeed in ending the the blockade the bloqueo? At some point, it's it's uh, we've all wanted that, but that's one of Char, um, Charlene's questions. Um, are we going? Are we near the end of the bloqueo or no? We 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 are convinced, uh, Bill. Sooner than later, the bloqueo would have to stop. It would have to stop because it's an illegal policy, is an immoral policy, is rejected by inter the international community, and is also rejected clearly by the most of the population in the United States, including most of the Cuban uh, who live in the United States, who wants to have a normal relationship with their relative in Cuba and have the liberty uh, to, uh, to freely visit they are families in Cuba. Uh, this is an untenable policy. It's unsustainable politically, uh, economically, uh, morally, and ethically. Thank you. And we're going to move to the questions by Elliot Booker, uh, Time for Awakening Media. Uh, his first question was, which of the G7 countries uh, requested that have uh, made requests to trade with Cuba before and after the UN vote? Um, did you have a lot of the G7 countries um, already in, in, in sync with you doing uh, trade with Cuba? Well, the, the, only, the only G7 uh, country with whom uh, Cuba doesn't have a, a, a normal relationship is actually with the US. With the rest, with the rest of the G7 uh, member countries, Cuba has a normal relationship, including economic uh, um, uh, relationship, which is also very much and um, damage because of the extraterritorial um, impact uh, of the blockade. And as you know, the, the blockade is not only something that affects directly uh, the bilateral links between Cuba and the US, but something that has a very profound consequences also for uh, third countries and third countries companies who want to engage in a normal economic trade or financial uh, relationship with Cuba. And um, what are we with the COVID-19? Uh, 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 how many of uh, the, the various vaccines are in phase three of the trials? Um, where are we at with the various vaccines? Uh, Bill, um, this is, I, I would like to first to, to refer that um, the fact that Cuba has been able to produce um, five vaccine candidates um, is very well um, 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 you know, uh, built on, 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 on the investment effort that the country has done uh, for years. I, I would like to remember it was Fidel in, in, 19, in 1960 when, when, when the creation of the Cuban National Scientific Research Center uh, who said that the future of Cuba would have to be 
a future of country, a future of men and women of sciences. And, and, and that in itself, and, and, and close the, the, the meaning of what we have been able to achieve, uh, not only now, but in recent years, I would like to, re to remind, for example, um, the, 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 um, the strike made by Cuba when we developed um, the um, anti-meningococcid vaccine, um, the, extra, the strides made in, in, in developing um, different kinds of vaccines and, and other uh, pharmaceuticals by the Cuban pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so this new uh, development is very closely related, um, not only to that investment in, in infrastructure, uh, but also to the investment in human resource uh, development. And, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, we, we, we said that we, as a blockaded country, actually, we didn't have any other option than to try to put the best of our science and our scientific um, resources to, 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 to try and, and, and to go and, 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 and develop projects to, to, to try to uh, come up with our own uh, vaccine candidates to fight uh, the pandemic. And of course, this, this envisage um, a, lot of, a lot of efforts, a, a lot of commitment by the, um, all the scientists, a lot of cooperation. It's, it's, it was not a task um, of one single institution. It, it has been um, the outcome and, and, the, and the result of the very close cooperation among the many um, scientific institutions in the biotech industry in the country. And, and, well, and Cuba has reached out to the other uh, South American Caribbean countries as well. They've been generous in, in going out to, of course, everyone knows about the Brigadistas going out to help so many others er, around the world. But in particular for the vaccine, have uh, they reached out uh, to, to I, I assume that they've been reaching out as well to the other countries of the Caribbean and South America, correct? Yeah, we have been clear uh, since the beginning, and as I said before as well, I mean, we, um, the, the resource that Cuba um, um, will be um, achieving at this will be uh, clearly shared uh, with countries in Latin America as well as other countries in, in, in the world. But a number of countries, I can say, that have approached already uh, Cuba, uh, are very much interested in, in, in the outcomes, and, and, and with some of them, we have already signed uh, agreements for when the vaccines are in, 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 in production phase and when they have been approved by the Cuban regulatory agency and are in the market and, and um, uh, trials are being conducted also in some other countries like uh, uh, Venezuela, Iran, some Caribbean countries has also uh, approached and, and some of the South uh, southern nations in Latin America as well have um, show as Mexico have shown interest in, in, in having access when um, those vaccines are in the, in, uh, in the production phase. Thank you. Elliot had one last question. It was about, you know, uh, years ago, the Congressional Black Caucus signed a memorandum of understanding to try to get, uh, encourage youth, uh, uh, especially people of color, kids of young uh, youth of color to get educated there and to become doctors through the wonderful program that Cuba offers to um, develop young doctors to go back to their communities and, and serve them. Um, it's, uh, Elliot's uh, question is, it seems like the there's not that much force going or not, not that much encouragement going on um, by the Congressional Black Caucus at, that, at this time. So how do we um, stimulate that? How do we make sure that, that, um, that our, the, dist, uh, the, the unrepresented communities are getting their medical staff trained there? Uh, and that the, if the Congressional Black, Black Caucus isn't following through to, to push that, how do we push that so that we make sure the next generation's uh, uh, doctors are coming our way to serve the communities through Cuba's educational program? Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, I, I think it, this is a very relevant um, um, question. And I, I can say Cuba has kept um, its commitment uh, to, to facilitate uh, the scholarships for 
uh, underrepresented uh, 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 community uh, um, uh, people, students in, 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 in the US to have access to um, health studies in, 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 in Cuba. And we are also very uh, grateful, I have to, to acknowledge uh, uh, here uh, the, the commitment and, and the permanent um, uh, fight of ESCO, uh, ESCO Pastor for Peace in, 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 in keeping also this program um, actually, as, as Gail uh, mentioned at the opening, around um, 200 um, graduates already uh, have produced um, uh, this program and we will be uh, very happy to see uh, more Jews uh, from the U.S. Uh, coming uh, to take advantage of, of, of this and we are, very, um, we are also open to continue working um, not only with uh, IFCO um, um, on this, but um, also with other initiatives on this. We, we think um, that is important. One uh, um, uh, um, one of the ways I think um, um, it can be, you know, um, made more visible the the the, the contribution of this um, student um, is to, to to bring more to the public of what they are doing now. For example, they they, they have been inserted in different. Um, medical institutions all around um, um, the U.S. Um, I think it would be, you know, it would help um, uh, to make more visible what each of them is doing um, um, in every, um, in all those places where, where they are to, to bring them together and to talk to different communities, to, to talk to their representative to, to in their state assemblies or they are representative in Congress and, and, and so on. Those, those are, um, I, in, in my view, very useful ways to raise awareness and on the importance of this program. Correct, okay. Wilmer Leon, the author of uh, Politics and Other Perspective, who's also the host of Inside the Issues on Sirius XM satellite radio channel 126, he asked, uh, he, he first has a sort of a general statement, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken and President Biden talk about protecting or enforcing rules-based uh, order instead of protecting and enforcing international law. In light of the recent vote of the UN on the bloqueo, how hypocritical is it for the U.S. to blockade or sanction countries that are not in violation of international law? That's part one. And, and, and part two of the question is, um, let's talk about the anti-imperialist coalitions that are being formed, whether it's Viet, uh, Venezuela, Cuba, Iran, China. How are the anti-imperialist co uh, coalitions um, uh, relating to each other to um, provide for health and well-being? Th those were the two questions of Wilmer and Leon. Uh, um, well, uh, Bill, uh, I. I I mean, you, you, you just said it. I mean, this is a very high political uh, uh, policy. It's, it's untenable. Um, simply, uh, the US government cannot um, sustain its policy towards Cuba. And we, and we have demonstrated that we are able uh, to sit down together and to fix um, all our differences. And, and, and of course, we know that we cannot uh, I mean, um, um, solve all of them. We are different and we have to respect um, each other, um, um, even with our own um, differences and respect them, um, the, each other respected um, sovereignty um, equality, which is a principle of international law and, and architecture. And, 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 and of course, um, not only the case of Cuba, but also so many other people and countries in the UN are realizing um, this hypocritical approach of, of um, the US uh, government when um, uh, looking at, at, at some um, relevant international and very um, sticky issues of international importance, uh, um, not only with Cuba, for example, the issue of Venezuela or the policy um, in relation to, um, to, um, to other countries. Um, um, of course, and the, 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 the the awareness um, that um, I, what I referred before, all these um, um, solidarity um, coalitions and, and, and grouping, um, the, the caravans, the, the, the love, um, the bridge, um, love, um, building bridge of love initiative are also quite important to, 
um, to um, counteract these other, um, you know, um, um, hypocritical rhetoric and, and coming back to uh, the international arena and coming back to multilateralism. Uh, it's very clear that if you come, if you argue that you're coming back to uh, multilateralism and you argue that you are committed uh, to principles of uh, multilateral um, 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 resolve of, of dispute, uh, the issue of Cuba uh, uh, um, puts that to the test. And, and that is very uh, much clear. Great. Thank you. We're going to turn the questioning over to Marguerite right now. Marguerite Horberg from Hot House, take it away. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's really a very stimulated and educational conversation we're having. And uh, repeating what Bill said earlier, a number of the questions we received sort of cover um, similar ground around the vaccines and, and policy and the post June 23rd. Um, so if I don't read um, the entire question, please uh, feel free to write in the chat that uh, the question, your question wasn't adequately answered. Um, so I'm um, the first question I'm uh, representing is from the All African People's Revolutionary Party in New Mexico, and it's from Oni Esonu Chatoyor, who's a Hood Communist and Weekly Pan African News, an AAPRP program from New Mexico, and it's another policy question. Um, and the question is um, asking about the allegations around human trafficking. The question says, recently Anthony Blinken accused the world respected and renowned Cuban medical team of engaging in human trafficking during the 2021 Trafficking in Persons Report launch ceremony. How do you think this outlandish charge is related to the U.S. recent blockade resolution vote? And what do you think a statement like this signals about the intentions of the Biden administration toward Cuba? Thank you very much, Marguerite, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the question. I, I think clearly this is a very um, um, hypocritical uh, um, um, accusation. Um, um, and as I said before, uh, it shapes very, it shaped very much the, the 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 conduct and the attitude of the current U.S. administration. Nobody can argue, nobody can seriously argue that Cuba is a country that is engaged in trafficking in persons. Uh, Cuba has a very um, um, clear commitment to combat. Uh, uh, trafficking in person, and, and, and it's very unfortunate that the current administration uh, uh, decides to, 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 to endorse uh, in some way the accusation of the um, uh, President Trump's ad administration that everybody knows was with the purpose, uh, the intended purpose to, um, um, to cut um, 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 resources by, by Cuba. Um, um, Everybody knows that um, the, the, the health cooperation, the international health uh, cooperation that Cuba provides to uh, a number of countries is sustained on bilateral arrangement and bilateral agreements signed with um, all those uh, countries interested in, 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 in the Cuban cooperation. All those professionals involved in that cooperation decide freely uh, without um, any um, 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 governmental uh, uh, pressure on their participation, and they they sign contracts uh, uh, for um, engaging in this um, cooperation uh, program. This is an a slander and a, and a smear uh, campaign that we have denounced, and we will continue um, uh, to denounce. And it's only uh, you know um, trying and. and and it's very, um, uh, you know, also in, in times of pandemic, it's, it's also um, quite unfortunate that the U.S. engages in this politic of trying to deprive people of health assistance in other countries that otherwise that they cannot have. Because the, the, the work that Cuban professionals 
uh, do in those countries cannot be easily um, um, supplemented by, by, by professionals, um, um, national professionals in those countries or any other foreign uh, professional. Um, so this is a, a, an, an, an unsustainable um, 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 campaign. Uh, Cuba, that Cuba has denounced and will continue uh, to denounce. And we have a proven history um, even in, um, of cooperative um, um, uh, relationship with the UN mechanisms um, um, that work in the area of trafficking in, in person. The, the US cannot sustain those accusations against Cuba. Thank you. There's, a, there's sort of a second part of that question, which which has to do uh, with how Africans in the US and I'm assuming other people of color who are faced with an onslaught of slander and propaganda, how can uh, people join in solidarity to uh, combat this kind of uh, false narrative and, and be more effective in, in fighting this propaganda campaign? Well, I'm, I, I, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I would have to say, for example, uh, many, many of the countries, many of the countries, and, 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 and we, we had uh, more than 50 statements, more than 50 statements during the General Assembly session that, they, that examined the issue of the US blockade on, on Cuba. And many of those uh, statements at the General Assembly uh, referred specifically uh, to the appreciation and, 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 and the value that those countries attach to the Cuban medical cooperation. And, and, and many of those stress um, the value that their people give to uh, the cooperation and work by the Cuban uh, medical professional in their countries. Also during the high level segment in the General Assembly, a, a, a very quite uh, relevant number of the leaders who participated in the settlement uh, in that high level weight settlement um, also underline um, the, 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 the importance and, and, and the appreciation of, um, of their governments for the solidarity that Cuba uh, had put in place in cooperating in the, in the health sector through the medical brigades uh, with those countries. Many of those countries are from Africa, uh, from the Caribbean. And also I would have to say many of these caravans because the, the caravan movement has become, started here in the US, but now has become more an international movement. And every month in, in, in many cities around the world, included in many of the African cities, we have seen caravans of, of people um, against the blockade and calling for the lifting of this unjust policy. So, so uh, um, we very much uh, uh, believe that our African sisters and brothers have also much to say and much to contribute to this uh, international movement um, against the embargo. Thank you for that reply. I think that if people have uh, links to how to get involved, they could put them in the chat. Um, so the next question I feel we've covered a little bit already, which has to do again with the uh, vaccines, the distribution, other ways people can help uh, with Cuba in the mission. The question was posed by the All African People's Revolutionary Party, Sobukwe Shakura and Shavanduka Savanhu. And um, since we've uh, discussed it kind of at length, I think the question narrow, more narrowly focuses on, uh, maybe you could speak perhaps about the syringe uh, program, if that's a way people uh, could help. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we, we very much appreciate um, all the movement that has been put in place here uh, in the US, but also in, in many other uh, part of the world, in, of the world in, 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 in trying to mobilize um, um, assistance to Cuba uh, with the development of the vaccine uh, uh, program. And, and 
the syringes problem uh, program that was already mentioned uh, by um, by Gail in the opening statement, uh, we, we we attach a lot of importance and appreciation uh, to that. And of course, that is one of the areas I, I, I said it um, because of the embargo, we, we are lacking a lot of uh, um, 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 spare parts and 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 disposable materials and and you know syringes are part of those um, um, disposable uh, um, for putting in place um, the, the the vaccine uh, program which has been um, also affected uh, um, the scaling down of the production precisely because of the lack of some of the um, of the inputs needed for the production um, not for the vaccine itself but uh, for the production in an industrial scale, because you need, of course, a number of, um, of, of items, a number of inputs to guarantee, you know, um, the, the, the production scale of, of the vaccine. And of course, the syringes are, um, are very much key um, to that effort. So I, 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 I think, and, and we will continue to appreciate um, every effort that is done in trying to um, mobilize here in the U.S. and in other part of the world of the world uh, um, uh, syringes for Cuba. I, I want to uh, just kind of pick up a thread in the chat that sort of also referred to the question, which really tries to emphasize the relationship between Africans in the U.S. and Cuba. So, if there's um, something uh, more specific or pointed about how that particular relationship and solidarity can be strengthened. Uh, um, Margaret, th there is an extricable link between between Cuba um, and Africa. I mean, and 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 we, in, in, in the formation, in the building up of our nation and, and, and the contribution made uh, by Africa to, to to what Cuba is today, to, to Cuba's independence, to Cuba um, 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 sovereignty. Um, I, 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 I would not mention because it would be so so many those who who contributed to um, to to the fight um, 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 uh, to the fight for our independence and 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 and, and to the formation of the Cuban um, identity. Uh, so uh, whatever whatever. Uh, um, Africans are we, we are seeing each other as, as sisters and and and, and brothers, uh, regardless where they are, if they are in Africa or if they are in, in, in the US. And there are a lot of uh, reasons for us to continue engaging in 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 in, in on issues of, of interest for both Africans and, and Cuba. And there is no frontier. I mean the, the, the fact that our brothers are uh, can be here in the US or can are there in other countries is, is, is not is not a barrier uh, for us not to engage in in on 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 mobilizing awareness and issues that that bring us that bring us together and we will be always uh, uh, looking at that and we'll be always uh, open um, um, to that networking um, 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 sort of activities and 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 engaging with our, our brothers and sisters of Africa. Thank you. Um, my last question um, that I'm reading is from Matt Cedillo from Telewagwar, and it includes uh, participation by Karina Acre Paez, Ernesto Ayala from the Chicano Grassroots Media Group. And the question has to do with how Chicanos can aid the process of global decolonization. And the question says, at the General Assembly of the UN, you stated more than 60 years after the adoption of the Declaration on the granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples, the process of global decolonization has not been completed and the goals set forth in the Declaration are yet to be met. The fourth international decade for the eradication of colonialism 
recently declared by the General Assembly at its 75th session constitutes an impetus to the common aspiration of all member states to completely eradicate colonialism. On behalf of Chicanos living here in the American Southwest, Atslan, as we know it, we wish to thank you for your comments. We would ask your counsel as to how everyday people, working people living inside the belly of the beast can best connect our efforts to the process of global decolonization. Very, very, very relevant question. Uh, again, raise your voice, raise your voice, um, raise your voice to the UN, write to the UN, approach the UN committee on the colonization to which we are a member. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I mean, we have an opportunity. This is the fourth UN uh, decade on, on decolonization. Uh, is we, we have achieved a lot in that area, but the fight is not over. It's far from being over. So I, all what you can say, all, all um, your lobby, all your letters, all your awareness uh, um, uh, campaigns, all that contribute uh, to the purpose of decolonization. There are still 17 territories um, which are not, uh, which are not be, being given the opportunity uh, to, to, to their people to decide freely on their uh, self to exercise their self-determination uh, right. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's a very uh, a relevant concern. And, and my, my response to that is just keep, keep the fight on that. Thank you. I'm turning it back over to, to William Martinez. Thank you very much. William, wow. Okay. <laughs> to Bill. Okay. Uh, if, if you I, me, I, I also would like to, to, to recognize and, and, and thank um, the Get Out of Cuba campaign and also the Zimbabwe Cuba uh, Friendship Association, which have been um, has been part of the organization of this event. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, big shout out to Obi uh, for putting all of this together. Um, we have two last questions. Actually, we're over time. Uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Cuesta has a, a, another engagement. So we're going to make this. We have four questions from uh, Jeanette Charles with the producer of Freedom Now, a Pan-Africanist revolutionary radio program on the National Independent Radio Pacifica Network. Uh, Jen Jeanette, forgive me for this. I have to uh, pick one of the four five, six questions. And I, I want to narrow it down to this one for now. And maybe you can uh, ask Mr. Uh, Ambassador Cuesta about this later on. But this question, I think, is, is uh, sort of summarizes a lot um, about the roles of the Cuban women, youth, and families in fighting the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, and in particular in the scientific research process, um, uh, and how the Cuban people are informed and how they're getting their vaccines. What's the role of a family, basically, uh, in Cuba in, in advancing um, the COVID education and, uh, and cures? Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, uh, again, uh, a very important question. And, and in, in, in trying to summarize my response, uh, uh, we, we say in Cuba, um, it's not a vaccine. Um, it, it, it's not an institution. It's a country behind that. And, and, and we have to understand that is 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 our women, is our youth, is our scientists, is our uh, 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 policy making uh, uh, people, is is the intelligence, all the intelligence of the country, uh, putting be, uh, has been put behind uh, this process. I mean, the the youth it cannot be understood against we have we we we. We, we had um, in the fight um, of the pandemic, particularly in the, the very uh, early, earlier stages, without mentioning the role of the Jews in, in, in the, in, you know, in, in going home by home, university students, uh, pre-university students, and engaging us voluntarily in, in tracing the suspects, in, in tracing the contacts to make awareness of the people 
uh, women in the Federation of, of, um, of Cuban um, of Women also supporting this program, our scientists, uh, many of these um, of the scientists that have been working on this, on the development of these vaccine projects are very young uh, people, uh, very extremely young people uh, with, uh, you know, with, without a very large um, 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 service, you know, um, 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 fire, but, but it's the commitment and, 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 and understanding the importance of the country uh, in, in coming, coming up with its own, um, with its own treatment um, to fight the pandemic. Um, so in summary, uh, has been the, 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 the whole effort of a country uh, be, behind that and all the living forces of that country that is, is men, women, uh, Jews, and everybody um, 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 and, and, and following one cohesive and united um, um, direction of the country and, and, and the, under the direction of the government. And so this has been um, um, key and, and cannot be explained without understanding um, um, that, um, that intermix. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one final question, Marguerite. Uh, uh, we'll ask this question. Unmute. Hello, Marguerite. Testing, testing. There we go. Taken by surprise. Hello. Um, the question comes from Zainab Al Safar from the Al Yadin TV, which is a pan Arab uh, TV channel. And uh, the question says, it's a kind of a long question, but it says the US is overstretched and nearly bankrupt and faces lots of challenges domestically, yet it uses its weapon of unilateral coercive maximum pressure and sanctions against various countries as resistance movements among them Cuba. To what extent do you believe that such sanctions are doomed to fail now more than ever? Uh, a good note to leave on, I think, because you've, you've already said it's doomed to fail, but maybe there's a little bit Marguerite, more to say. Marguerite, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for the question. It's, it's, it's very true. Uh, we, we are living, unfortunately, in a world where we see um, each time more the emergence of um, this sort of um, um, coercive and punitive um, actions by, by, by countries that have a, a, a very key role um, in, in, in the world because of their strategic and, 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 and economic importance as the case of the US. But I have to say something, no sanction, no sanction, it doesn't matter how strong it, it might be, or it doesn't matter how long, for how long time they are put in place, like the case of, of Cuba, which is the country that has suffered uh, the, the, the longest, the longest um, um, and more comprehensive sanction regime um, um, that exists in, in, in the world for over 60 years, can blend, can blend the will of the people. I mean, we, the, the sovereignty and the independence and the resolution of the Cuban people to live in independence and to live in sovereignty cannot be blamed with any sanction. That's why I said at the beginning that this is untenable. Uh, this, this cannot be um, um, sustained. And we are convinced that sooner than later, the embargo would have to be uh, lifted. Also, with your cooperation, with your demands, uh, with your uh, solidarity, to which we attach a lot of um, importance. I, I, I really uh, thank you all uh, very much for all the, the very relevant and, and important uh, questions. Uh, thank you to all the, the media, members of the media uh, participating in this. Uh, virtual meeting. Um, thank you deeply to uh, to our 
to the organizers, to, um, to the Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association, to the Cuba Get Out of Cuba um, um, campaign, to the National Network in Cuba, uh, to IFCO, uh, Pastors for Peace, and, and, and to the many others I'm sure are behind the organization of this exchange. I thank you all for your presence and for your very relevant question. I'm very much aware there are still many, many questions um, uh, out there, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that there will be so many other opportunities for us to uh, uh, to engage and 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 for me to respond to your to your questions of today and your questions of tomorrow. Thank you very much uh, deeply for your presence. Thank you very much, Ambassador Cuesta. Um, Obi, I think you have some closing remarks. Um, yes. Um, good. Good. Good afternoon. Now. Um, on behalf of the um, Zimbabwe Cuba Friendship Association, on behalf of the Get Out of Cuba Way um, campaign and movement, um, we were so honored to thank you, um, Excellency, for your time, um, your statements, and we thank the people and the revolution of Cuba for remaining so steadfast. Um, I'd like to also thank um, Mr. Martinez, and Miss Marguerite um, Horberg for um, their efforts. And um, it's always an honor and a privilege to be in the company of um, Reverend Dr. Joan Brown Campbell and her husband, um, Reverend Pennybaker. Because as the great poet Sterling Brown once said, struggle is a marathon, never a race. So we were happy um, to be with them today. Um, in closing, we say that what this event represented is we are going from solidarity to camaraderie. Solidarity was yesterday. Camaraderie is the order of the day because it is that type of fervor, that type of tenacity that will determine whether the blockade on Cuba is lifted. We say that um, our collaboration with IFCO, our collaboration with NNOC, our collaboration with the Saving Lives Campaign represents a much needed alliance between the dispersed network that does Cuba solidarity work and the assembled network. So um, anytime we are able to close ranks, it is of paramount importance. And it is us showing an illustration of taking advantage of the historical moment. We say in the spirit of follow-up and thank you ambassador for challenging us to follow up. Cuba needs a permanent press corps in the diaspora and on the African continent. In 1959, on Christmas Day, the Hall of Fame heavyweight champion, Joe Lewis, led a delegation of National Newspaper Publisher Association journalists to Cuba. Ebony Magazine was part of that, to sit down with Comandante Fidel Castro to discuss the role of the media in dealing with tourism of that time. And since then, they have been challenges so that they have an alternative press corps. So the fact that we had press from Iran here today press out of Germany today, here today, Canada here today, and all over the United States represents the will and the sincere interest to make this a reality. So we are calling for on before the end of this year as a follow-up to this event, a sit down between press all over the world and Prensa Latina, the national media outlet in Cuba to make that a reality. In the spirit of journalists like William Worthy, a true freedom rider who as early as 1961 put his life on the line to go to Cuba to challenge US imperialist travel restrictions. To design a state of, and if you share my sentiments, isn't it beautiful to be in the presence of a diplomat who represents a nation that is a classic example of true homeland security when you represent um, invading another people's land, conquering another people's land, raping another people's land, plundering another people's land, you can never claim to secure that homeland. You're a thief and an, inv an invader, and we are being kind. To the Zionist state of Israel, who decided to follow the United States in this genocidal policy, we have one thing to say to you. Adolf Hitler would have been very proud of you. We say that because in the history books, 
of our former colonizers and captors when it comes to dealing with fascism, when it comes to dealing with terrorism, when it comes to dealing with colonialism, Adolf Hitler stands alone. But when we look at this track record of the Zionist state of Israel, we say with no apologies that David Ben-Gurion and Menachem Begin and Moshe Dayan and Golda Meir and Benjamin Netanyahu and Yitzhak Rabin would have given Hitler a run for his money any day. Amen. Israel is no stranger to shaming themselves at the United Nations. When they stood up in the United Nations solo and voted against Tunisia's right to self-determination, they had no shame. When they stood up and were the only nation to oppose Algeria's right to self-determination, when they became independent, they had no shame. And when they took it upon themselves to support apartheid in what's called South Africa, apartheid in what's called Zimbabwe, apartheid in what's called Zim, um, Zambia, apartheid in what's Excuse called me, Namibia. Bobby. Excuse yeah. me, Bobby. I think uh, the ambassador is trying to say goodbye. Okay, uh, go ahead. Go, go, go ahead, ambassador. Okay. Um, I, thank you. I thank you deeply. And I'm sorry for interrupting you, but it's that I have to just leave. I'm over, I have another engagement. I, I am overpassed already in, in time. No thank you. Thank you, thank you thank very much. Thank you, uh, Excellency. Uh, to you. And I I do, I thank you, John. I don't think so. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Gail. Much, very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay. He's exploiting and, and picking. Okay, so can I can I finish? So picking up where I left off. So their support of apartheid in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, in Mozambique in Angola and in Namibia, who were colonized by the Germans, showed that Israel is consistent. Now shifting real quickly to the Biden administration, for those in the US born African community who have propagated the notion that the last four and a half years for our people was worse than our first 396, Joe Biden is here to challenge that narrative. Those of you who within his first 90 days you gave him a passing grade, you were premature at best. Because Joe Biden is demonstrating to you by his, by his support of the blockade on Cuba, renewing the sanctions on Zimbabwe, which he is a co-sponsor of, favoring sanctions on Venezuela, planning regime change in Eritrea, he is not interested in the traditional cavalier, deceitful caricature of a Democratic Party white liberal. He prefers to be walking in the footsteps of Harry Truman, who's responsible for breathing life into Zionist Israel and the CIA in the first place. He prefers to walk in the footsteps of George Wallace, Ross Barnett, Oval Farbers, and those who were liberal on the outside, but white supremacist on the inside all day, every day. To the United States government, what this vote shows is we as Africans and other oppressed people in the world, we are no longer interested in your lectures and crash courses on democracy. Because evidently you don't know the meaning of the word or the same people who taught you democracy are the same people who taught Christopher Columbus geography when he came to the United States and thought he was an Indian. We say that um, to those and we are, and for those who have worked feverishly and tirelessly to sabotage our genuine efforts to fight to lift the blockade on Cuba, who every chance we get to use a platform to bring it up, whisper that, oh, there's racism in Cuba. And they feel compelled to mention that on our heels all the time. We have a question for them. How did it feel watching a Spanish speaking African represent Cuba diplomatically with integrity and decency and honor? That's what you saw today. So if you're going to continue to propagate that narrative, we're here to tell you you're fighting a losing battle. You will never be able to divert attention from the genuine efforts to get the blockade lifted. And if you are going to deal with the racism, there's no need to ca parrot Carlos Moore sentiments because there's no need to parrot Henry Louis Gates sentiments because the racism in Cuba is a byproduct of colonialism and the captivity of our ancestors because no nation has done more in the Americas to eradicate racism than Cuba. But if you wanna to continue to play little league nationalism, be our guest because we work very hard and every now and then we need to be amused 
just like everyone else. Um, in closing, when we come to deal with the Get Out of Cuba Way campaign, we too are going to, we too have been working. We had two concerts within the last year that had artists from 10 African nations, seven Caribbean nations, 17 US cities, and five European Union countries. The first phase of our campaign was to push for the Henry Reeve Medical Brigade to come to the United States. But in addition to that, we are now calling for the creation of a resource pool to support the 4,000 Cuban medical personnel strategically positioned all over the African continent. At a moment in time where non-communicable diseases have become the number one threat to all humanity, at a time when you look at the 25 poorest nations in the world and 22 of them are in Mother Africa, we say stand up and give our people an alternative to the United States Agency for International Development, give our people an alternative to the um, Bush Foundation, since he's supposed to be a born again humanitarian, an alternative to the Clinton Foundation, an alternative to Doctors Without Borders, an alternative to all imperialist entities who masquerade as humane and compassionate people. So we are saying that by the end of this year, we are starting with a few nations. We are going to push for our people in the diaspora to, to send technical support and material support to the African contingent in Cuba, representing the Henry Reeve Medical Brigade. And we will double down on our efforts to get more people to go to medical school in Cuba. For every George Floyd, a France Fanon. For every Trayvon Martin, a Charles Drew. For every, Bar for every um, Sandra Bland, a Barbara Justice. Because we, this represents a continuation of the work of the National Medical Association in 1896. This represents an extension of the work of Booker T. Washington when he established Negro Health Month. This is an extension of the work of Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois when he pushed, did a sociological study called the physique and health of the Negro American. So we are calling for a Pan-African linkage to defend the integrity of Cuba because we defend Cuba as Africans at home and abroad. So once again, the follow-up to this event will be, we are calling for a meeting with Prensa Latina and media all over the world who are interested and based on the representation we thank WPFW for recording this live. We thank KPFK, um, KPFT in Houston, and the whole um, the Washington Informer for consistently covering the Get Out of Cuba Way campaign, the Final Call newspaper for consistently covering the Get Out of Cuba Way campaign and movement. So that's our statement for today. We do not want to. Um, divert attention away from the um, incredible presentation that Ambassador Pedrisso Cuesta gave. And um, we're going to continue to close ranks with all of you. The recording of this press conference will be made available to press all over the world within the next couple of hours. We thank you all. Um, we um, exit and depart as we came in camaraderie, solidarity, and goodwill. Long live the Cuban people, long live the Cuban revolution, one unified socialist Cuba, one unified socialist Africa, one unified socialist planet. We thank you. And we thank you too, uh, Obi, for doing this work. That's it for Africa Vote Now Project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. We can be reached through all your regular social media platforms. Email AfricaWorldNailProject at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at AFWRLDNWPRJ. Instagram at Africa World Now Project. Access to our other media platforms can be reached through the bios of our social media. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa World Now Project Collective consists of international media journalists, executive producer and human rights activist, Moiza Muntali, Africa World Now Project media correspondent, Huna Ngonda, senior research content contributor and production director, Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui, senior research content contributor and production associate, Dr. Josh Myers, associate producer and content contributor, Dr. Keisha Khan Perry, content contributor and filmmaker, Kurt Orderson, technology advisor, it's Byron Gray of Greyworks Technologies, and creative directors, International creative and artist designer Tabasam Siddiqui and Judah Pope. 
Africa World Now Project can be heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC, NPR affiliate and broadcast service of Winston-Salem State University. Programs are archived and available on all podcast platforms. Search Africa World Now Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be intelligent.